All right, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our Hilly Chase, Hilly Chase speaker tonight, who is uh, one of uh, my friends for over 25 years. We've been friends and colleagues. Uh, Mr. Ben Tuff grew up um, splitting his time between Atlanta, Georgia, and Jamestown, Rhode Island. He attended Colby College, where he met his now wife, Gretchen, and treasured his times working as a sailing instructor and a boat captain in the British Virgin Islands. Between Jamestown and the BVI, Ben developed a lifelong appreciation for the ocean. Ben is a lifetime educator and has had the privilege of working with hundreds of boarding school students from across the world at um, at Rectory School, Kent School, Stratton Mountain School, with the majority of his time at Rumsey Mountain School, uh, where we first met um, when he was working there. Uh, in in uh, 2012, Ben made a life-altering decision to break free of the hold that the addiction of alcohol had on him. Despite not knowing how to swim, the sport of triathlon quickly arrived in his life. After seven years of com competitive triathlon, Ben made a switch to marathon swimming. After many crossings from Newport, Rhode Island to Jamestown, which is a fair distance, um, on the Save the Bay swims, Ben throttled it up with a 12.5 mile swim, um, KFC swim around uh, Key West. After that, he couldn't stop uh, and competed in a 21-mile swim around Jamestown and began his endeavor to uh, preserve the Rhode Island marine environment by raising money for the nonprofit Clean Ocean Access. His continu he continued his challenge with a 19-mile swim from Block Island to Jamestown, which is an incredibly treacherous passage of water. Most recently, swimming a 24-mile length from Narragansett Bay from Rhode Island, or from Providence, Rhode Island, to Jamestown, Rhode Island. A steam producer, Matt Corliss, cor uh, chronicled Ben's journey to sobriety and the parallels of his recent swim. Ben has successfully raised over $270,000 dollars preserve the local marine environment of Rhode Island, which has got all gone to the clean ocean access. So this evening, let's uh, give our attention to Mr. Ben Tuff, uh, and we are pleased to have him and welcome him to Eagle Brook. Thank you very much, Mr. Loftus. And it is so awesome to be back on a junior boarding school campus because I spent close to 20 years of my life with students from around the world, just like you all, at Rumsey Hall School. And in the end, it's really not that different. I hope you all are better at following directions than the Rumsey Hall students are, because I'm gonna ask you to do something for a second. I'm gonna ask you to use your imagination. And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that you are swimming in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, the middle of it. Behind you, eight miles behind you is Block Island, and in front of you, another nine or 10 miles is the mainland of Rhode Island. Now you can't see anything. All around you, all you see is water and the horizon meeting the sky. To your left, you have a 22 foot boat that is supporting you and on that boat, are all your best friends. For me, that's three very important individuals. And then on my right, 
I have my other buddy, Jake. He's on a paddleboard, and his sole job is to keep me going in the right direction and also giving me food when I most need it every 35 minutes or so. Now, I am a non-traditionalist, and I like to swim with music. So I always have my headphones on when I do these swims, and I'm listening to reggae music almost the whole time. So when I feel on my back the tapping of Jake's paddle, I know something isn't quite right. So I take my earphone off, and I look at him. I said, Jake, what's up? Like, you never bother me unless it's time to feed, and it's not time to feed. He said, Ben, this is the first decision we have to make on this swim. And I said, well, what's that? He said, you have to decide whether you're going to get into the boat right now or whether you're going to keep swimming. I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, below us, we have a 15 to 17 foot great white that is pinged on the radar. And you have to decide whether you're going to keep going or whether you're going to call it quits. Now, keep in mind, on my left ankle, I wore this device that I'm holding right here. It had about a half pound battery pack. This is straight out of Australia, new technology, and it was the only technology that's been proven to keep great whites away from human beings. Attached onto that battery pack is a three foot long coil. And every six seconds, that coil puts off an electric shock. And it shocks all the water around me. And no one told me, and I should have tried it out first, but it also shocks my leg all the way up my body. So I know it's working. And I don't know if you have mean brothers like I do, but they used to take those electric dog collars and put it on me and throw me over the line because they thought it was really funny. Well, it feels a lot like that. Now, in this other picture, you can see the pinging of the shark. And I thought about it for a nanosecond. And I looked up at Jake. I said, Jake, are you serious? We are going to keep on swimming. I didn't swim six miles for nothing. I've got this contraption on my leg, and no sharks are going to get me today. So let's keep going. This is what we call in endurance sports or in life facing a wall. Okay, this was a psychological wall that I had to face. Do I continue on through this fear? Or do I call it quits? We can face two types of walls. We can face our physical walls, which is just having the, the ability to keep going, and these psychological walls. And I was not going to let a psychological wall get me down because I knew deep down inside I had gone through way more than just a shark being below me. So we kept going and we persevered. Now this is a picture, the next greatest threat we, we faced that day were fishermen with their big nets who thought it would be funny to get as close to us as possible. And we called the Coast Guard to steer them off course. And the Coast Guard, who were awesome, followed us along for the next three hours until we were out of the, the main fishing way. So the question is, like, how did I end up swimming in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with four of my best friends around me? I found it by finding sobriety. And this started when I was much, much younger. 
I was the same age as all of you. I was 13 years old when I first had my, when I had my first panic attack. And it was after my first day of school, after moving to Atlanta, Georgia, and I remember sitting on the stoops of that, that school, and I was rocking back and forth, convinced that I was having a heart attack. My, my heart was palpitating. I didn't know what was going on. I had all this stress of the day. It was all wound up, and I didn't know how to let it all out. Now, it didn't help that I have an identical twin brother, and he was sitting next to me, making fun of me the whole time. And that's the way I grew up. But I knew something was fundamentally wrong with me when I was much younger, and I started to have these anxiety attacks. And these anxiety attacks, as I grew older, just got closer and closer together. And I, I didn't know how to get rid of them. My parents didn't know what to do with them. And I was just left to fend on this all on my own. Now, the one thing I did find in high school and in college was there was one thing that would help me through these anxious times. And that was alcohol, and it was drinking. So I resorted to drinking on a regular basis to alleviate these symptoms. What I didn't know was that I was just adding to them the whole time along. And this continued to grow and build, and I became more out of control until I finally had to ask for help. Now, when I thought of rehab, and I'm sure you all have heard the term rehab, I thought it was a place where drug addicts and people off the streets and scary people all went when they couldn't do anything else. But for me, rehab was a chance for rebirth. It was a chance for me to start all over again. I went into rehab and on the third day there, I was told that I had to come back with a sponsor from the meeting. And I was listening to all these meetings, and I finally heard this gentleman talk. He had an Irish accent. His name was Ken, and he did triathlons. And I was like, man, this guy sounds like the bomb. This is going to be the dude that I choose as my sponsor. So after the meeting, I said, Ken, love hearing you talk. I would love to try triathlon. Number one, will you be my sponsor? And number two, will you, or do you think that I can learn how to swim? Because I don't know how to swim. I can get from point A to point B, but it's more like just treading water. He said, yes, I'll be your sponsor, and yes, you can do a triathlon. I went home that night, and what I didn't know is that Ken went home that night, and he signed me up for a triathlon two and a half months later. And he didn't tell me until the day I left rehab. He said, Ben, you got six weeks. You got six weeks to learn how to swim a half a mile because you have a triathlon all set up, ready to go. And that's when my swimming began. And I would hop in the pool every morning. And at first, it was just half a length and then the other half, and then a half a length and the other half. And then in a week's time, it was going one length by one length, one length by one length, and it was still really hard. But eventually, after five weeks, I was ready to go. I could swim a half a mile 
all at once, and nothing was going to get in my way. And I also found that during this time, I was at peace with everything. I could process everything. I could get through all the thoughts and all the problems of that previous day, and it was not a problem. Keep in mind, this is the extent of my swimming. It always involved noodles. This was after one of my knee surgeries. And I really could only tread water. And then after, uh, it was about six years of competitive triathlons, okay, I decided to sign up for a two-mile swim. Where was this going to go for it? Now, you might ask, why would you give up triathlons? I was one of the you know, top male triathletes in my age group. I was doing really well. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. My wife decided that she was going to try triathlon that summer as well. And within three months, she was smoking me at triathlon. Uh, and she went on to become one of the top Iron Man or Iron Women uh, in the country in her age group. But I was like, okay, I need to do my own thing. I am going to just do swimming. And this is a picture from the Save the Bay swim where I swam from the naval base in Newport, Rhode Island, all the way to shore. And in the end, it wasn't that hard. And I came home that night, and my daughter was nine years old at the time. And we got online, and I said, OK, Maisie, where do you want to go on vacation this summer? And she said, well, I don't know, anywhere that has palm trees. So we looked for races with palm trees. And there just happened to be this island, the southernmost point of the United States, United States that's called Key West. And they have this swim where you swim all the way around Key West. And I was like, sweet, like you'd be looking at cool fish. The water won't be cold. Like this is going to be a really easy swim. What I didn't realize is it was going to be 93 degrees in the water, and I would get overheated really easily really easily, but it was fun. I finished and I said, okay, this next one's going to be a big one. And I decided to do a, a swim around Jamestown, Rhode Island. And I said, I got to add a little accountability here. I need to raise money for a cause so that I can go out and let people know this is what I'm doing. I'm bringing attention to an important cause, which is the environment. And it also means that I can't quit. It'll allow me to push through that wall a little easier. So this is the last mile of that swim. And you can see my paddleboarder to the right, Jake, and me in the middle and my best friend and coach to the left, uh, David, and we're just we're going around the corner and, and, and finishing that up. And we were able to raise $54,000 for a great cause. And I immediately said, what's next? And that's when I decided to do Block Island. And everyone told me that that was crazy. It, wa it is the one of the biggest breeding grounds for the great white shark. August is a horrible time. The water's really cold. And I said, whatever, we're doing it anyway. And we were able to, to finish that swim. And then I decided to do all of Narragansett Bay. So if you look at a map and you see Providence from the Providence River all the way south to the opening of the ocean, I was going to be the first human being to do that. So I was the first human, and I got the world record for the Block Island swim, and I was going to do this. What I didn't realize was how difficult it was going to be. Another thing that happened that summer before I did this swim, I got a call from a director named Matt Corliss, who told me he wanted to make a movie about me. 
and he had just come across making some very successful movies, and he said, this next one, I want, about, I want it to be about you, recovery, and your journey. And I said, great, let's do it. I was able to finish the, as you'll see in, in the clip that I show you from the movie, I was able to finish that, and we were able to raise over $110,000 for Clean Ocean Access. But what does this all mean to you? You're probably sitting there and you're saying, like, I have nothing in common with this guy. Like, why is he talking to us right now? Every single person in this room will deal with addiction, whether it's with yourself, a loved one, a friend, a parent, Every single one of you will deal with that. What matters is how you deal with that and how you bring attention to it. When I was at rehab, on the fifth day there, I was meeting with my psychologist, and he said, Ben, you know what? I said, what? He said, you have bipolar disorder. I said, oh, awesome, I'm an alcoholic and I have bipolar disorder. Like, what else is wrong with me, doc? Like, just keep on telling me what's wrong. He said, no, that's what you've been doing this whole time. You've been self-medicating. You've been trying to get over this anxiety, these feelings that are buried so deep inside you. And oftentimes, we don't know how to ask for help. And everybody in this room needs to know how to ask for help and how to give help when it's time. Because there is going to be a time when you're going to have to do that. So these are kind of five tips that I want you to, to take with you today. Number one is to do the impossible. I was a very good soccer player in high school, then I gave it all up. I never knew how to swim, and I taught myself how to swim. And then I decided to start to do the impossible. And it might just be a small thing, but if we have these lofty goals of doing the impossible, great things can come of that. Two, we have to find accountability. If we don't find accountability, then we are going to be going through life without any direction. And if we have to create accountability, you need to start to do that for yourself. So for me, it was raising money for Clean Ocean Access. It was creating a support team around me that wouldn't let me quit. That is accountability. Three is to discover your wall. So many of you have probably gone and run the mile and thought that that was all you could give. But I guarantee you, you got another 20% left in the tank. You can go that much harder. It's that we are afraid of pushing ourselves to those limits. So we have to discover our walls. And that comes as psychological and physical. Four, lean on your support network. One thing that I learned when I got sober is I had 25 really, really close friends. And suddenly, I go away to rehab. When I come back, you know, how many, how, you know how many friends are left? Four. I still have those four dearest, dearest friends. They are my support network. They are everything. They show up for any race that I do. Any crazy endeavor that I have, they're going to be there. And I will be there for them. So remember, it's quality not quantity when it comes to friendship. Five, inspire others. 
we're only put on this earth for a little while. If we just do everything for ourselves the whole time, nothing good is going to come of it. Instead, why don't we work toward leaving a positive mark on those individuals and those people who we hold dearest to us and to those that we can actually make a difference with? Okay, I, before we show the movie, I want everyone to, to stand up for a second. Okay. Yeah, it's a little warm in here, We're getting a little tired. I get it. I want you to cross your arms. Nice and comfy. Everyone cross your arms. Okay, chilling, like that's good. Now cross them the other way. Other arm on top of the other one. How does that feel? Feels weird. For many of you, it feels weird. Do you know why? Yes, it's your comfort zone. It's because in your brain, you have so gotten used to folding your arms just one way. Well, we do that about everything. Every single thing we do in a day, it's all about staying in our comfort zone. If we spend a little bit more, a little bit more time getting out of our comfort zone to adopting a growth mindset over a fixed mindset, then in the end, we are going to be that much better off as human beings. Okay, you guys can sit. So this is going to be a, um, a, a little snippet of my movie from the middle. It, 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 this is starting in the middle of the movie, and you'll get a good sense to my adventure.
Okay, so that was a little teaser uh, from the middle of my movie. Let me just... So some of you are, are probably wondering how long that swim took. My last swim took 15 hours. And over the whole time uh, of that swim, I was drinking 17 ounces of water every 30 minutes. So that's a lot of water. Meanwhile, I burned just over 10,000 calories and was able to take in about 6,000, just over 6,000 calories through peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, through watermelon, maple syrup, Coke, Reese's peanut butter cups, anything that sounded good at the time. Um, but I also, I, I think it's important that Everyone understands how much I was ready to quit in that last swim. And the one thing that kept me going, and the reason why I continue to do these swims, is because it reminds me of everything that I've worked through this far in my life. And you all are going to come up to points in your life when you're like, ah, oh, I can't really get any farther. Like, this is horrible. I, I can't do this anymore. But I want, what I want you to do is think about the one time that you did push through and think about how that felt in the end. Because if you're able to do that now, when you're older, you're going to be able to do anything. So I also wanted to uh, open this up to questions and and answers. So um, for for those of you that have any questions for me uh, about my journeys, um, let me know. How about right here in the front? What's the name of, what's the name of your movie? Uh, the name of my movie is Swim Tough how I swam my way out of a bottle. It's, it's on Amazon. Um, I'm also, I'm going to, actually, I'm flying out to LA tonight uh, to meet with a lot of Hollywood people about the film. So uh, that's also something that will be fun. Yes. How do you, go to the you go. Yeah. You know, luckily, when it comes, if, if you're not like, if you're not peeing every 30 minutes, then you got a problem. Then you're probably dehydrated. Then you're, I ha, luckily, it's like lying in bed. And when you're in a horizontal position like that, your body really doesn't tell you to do that. I've been swimming now for 11 and a half years. And... I've done a lot of swims, six hours to 10 hours. Um, it's just like before a race, you got to prepare. What do you think the least recognized addiction is in, mi in minors and why? The least recognized addiction in, well, the least recognized will m most likely be having to do with what you all will do at 8.30 when, when you get your phones back. And um, whether you're, you're playing games or, or looking at TikToks or, or what have you, um, there is a strong correlation and, and a lot of research that talks about the dopamine receptors in all of your brains and how you use these videos and how you use these devices to get the same response as addicts do 
from their whatever their their drug of choice is. Um, so that's kind of a vague answer, but I would say that that's the one that's probably the one the the one area that a lot of you just kind of take for granted and don't think is a problem um, or a pro progressing problem when, in fact, it is. When's your next swim going to be? That, when is it or what is it? Both. Okay, so I have, uh, I, I have it down to two options. I don't know if anyone's ever been down to Florida off of Fort Myers to Sanibel Island, um, but I, I, I might be the first person to swim around Sanibel Island. Uh, the other option, which is kind of a pain because it involves sharks, and that is being the first person to swim around Block Island. Um, it'll be one of those two, and I've already started training. Everyone, everyone asks, how, how long have you been training? Well, I've been training 11 and a half years. I, I haven't stopped, right? I kind of throttle back, and then I go back, and then six months out, I start throttling back up until the race, and then, or the swim, and then I throttle back. Oh, yep. What do you think about during your swim that is over 10 hours? I think about everything. I think about how the good food I'm going to have. I would say the number one thing that I think about is what I'm thankful for. Because if we don't do that on a daily basis, and I was, I'm very ADHD, uh, and I have a, a serious problem staying still. And I have, I can't do yoga. I probably could if I worked hard enough at it. But I'm not very good at yoga. I'm not good at, good at meditating. But when I swim, it's like everything disappears. And it's just me in the water. And I have clarity of mind. You know, I, I write speeches. I, I go through my day. I pray. I, I do everything during that time. Because that's my only me time. The rest of the time is just noise. Do you think you did all those world records because of your de determination and mindset or because of your physical endurance? I am a horrible swimmer, okay? I am not kidding. If anybody who knows anything about swimming were to look at those videos of me swimming, they'll see a hundred things that I'm doing wrong. And every time I look at it, I kind of have to like wince away because I know what good swimming looks like. And I am not a very efficient swimmer. and I'm not a, a great, I don't have a great style of, of, of swimming, but I work my butt off. So there, there are some days that I will spend seven hours in the pool swimming without stopping. And to a lot of people, that's miserable, but to me, that's what's necessary to getting me to where I want to go. Um, I know that you're a great long distance swimmer, but by chance, do you know you're a 50 free time? <laughs> so I haven't done my, I haven't done my 50 free in, in so long, um, so I wouldn't even venture to guess. Like literally, and even when I do intervals, I'm doing like 500s, 1000s, 2000s, 4000s. Um, the, the shorter stuff is for the really good swimmers like you.